Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So welcome everyone. My name is Mildred and I'm the Urban Harvest Coordinator. Um, so we come to you live. We bring Urban Harvest Cooking and Preservation Workshop um, where we learn recipes as well as tips and tricks on how to uh, reduce food waste. So live workshops run twice a month on alternating Wednesdays at 2 p.m. over Zoom. In case you miss the session, we post the recording and recipe later on uh, YouTube and on our website. So we encourage people to come join our live session so that you can engage with our presenters, with our community leaders, and so we can answer your questions live as well. And I know a lot of people have questions on certain topics about preservation and cooking. Um, so our session today will be led by two of our community leaders, namely Celia and Daniel. Uh, but, uh, before we proceed, uh, we would like to acknowledge the land that we are on. Um, Black Creek Community Farm acknowledges that the sacred land in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the dish with one wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Black Creek Community Farm recognizes the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as the Turtle Island. So right now I just wanna introduce uh, Celia to everyone. Um, so Celia is our super uh, community leader volunteer in Jane and Finch. Uh, she's the founder and director of the Jane and Finch Youth Group for over 14 years. And she works with children and youth in the neighborhood, including homework tutorial. Okay. She leads, uh, she's the lead coordinator of the Driftwood Parkette Community Garden. She's a lead resident for the 415 Driftwood Resource Community Center. Uh, she's the senior community <laughs> garden coordinator at Black Creek Community Farm. And some of the words to best describe Celia is she's committed, she's dedicated, punctual, and a community leader. Uh, among her personal interests are community development, singing, counseling, praying, and reading the Bible. So here, uh, let me pass it over to Celia. Uh, Hi everyone. So um, again, my name is Celia, and I will be um, doing a recipe today that I love. Um, this recipe is that whenever I don't know what to cook, and I'm thinking, what can I cook today? And the easiest, the fastest thing I could get done, the easiest thing is to go to shrimp uh, and green vegetables. So today I'll be bringing to you um, shrimp with callaloo, Swiss chard, and kale. The ingredients is, um, so I'm gonna bring you today, frozen and fresh. So normally what I do in the summer, um, from the garden or whether from the farm where I do the, the senior program, I would chop my um, my sweet chard and I would bag them in freezer bags and um, my callaloo, which is a, a West Indies, I know other countries use it, but this is a West Indies callaloo and codfish we use, and this is kale. So I have, Slowly. <laughs> I have um, frozen kale today. And um, because my garden is doing well, I have um, switch chard. So I'm using fresh switch chard and fresh olive. So you know that we can also um, use them in the summer fresh, and then we freeze some of them for the winter. So because I do a lot of that, I don't have to go to the store and shop for these things in the summer. Um, I am using tomatoes that I freeze also, and that I'll be using today. Um, this is a bag with tomatoes and um, sweet pepper that I, and this is from last year that I, I harvest and froze. Um, the shrimps that I'm using today, it is frozen shrimp. Um, I just took it out of the, fr the freezer. And what I did, I stripped the tail because normally the tail has, um, the tail has the tail has some um, skin, 
you know, I don't know if you click the, the, um, the top of it. So this is what it looks like. So I like to take it off, take off the hen of it. So this is what I do. I take off the hen off the shrimp, the tail, take off the tail of the shrimp, and then after I take the tail off, then what I do is wash them. So the ones that are here, they're already washed. I just wanted to show you a sample of what, how I do it. So that is washed. And so um, that is how I do the shrimp and it's ready to go. So this is ready to go. Also, I use a lot of herbs. I love flavor. And because I love flavor, I use a lot of herbs. So in this, we have um, kelion. And this is scallion. This is also, it's not green onion, it's scallion. So it has a different flavor from the green, the green onion. It is stronger. So I cut it very fine. Like how you would cut the green, the green onion. So I cut it like that. For the tribe, I mistakenly cut it before. However, you cut it as fine as I'm cutting. Another thing I like to use is leek. I just like it in my, as a seasoning. A lot of people use it for soup, but I've never used it in soup. But I like to, and this is something that I dry. Because I dry all these herbs that I'm using. Uh, most of them I dry in the summer. So if you come to my house and look at my dining table, you will see a lot of things drying in the summer. Is the balcony will blow it, the wind will blow it away. So I like to put it on my table and um, and so that's scallion. And so we have the, the, the garlic chives, um, onion chives, and um, scallion, and I have basil. So this year I have three different types of basil. Everything is coming fresh from my garden. I harvest them yesterday evening. And so I have onions and I have three different types of basil, purple basil, and I have lemon basil. And I have the regular green basil that's in this um, container that I have ready to go with. Also, I use onion and thyme. And I'm a person that likes to use some ore oregano. So I just find one piece in there. I thought I had more. However, I don't. But I, use, I love lots of spice in my food. So you see how much spice I use when I'm cooking. That's a little bit of oregano. Are, all of these things are very good for you. And I use garlic. So I have a little bit of garlic and onion chopped already. However, I am going to just want to keep to do this. That's what you see. So you crush, crush the garlic. And after you crush it, I like to chop it fine. I chop it fine, and so that's ready to go. And then I have then I have the onion that I have already cleaned up. I get I wasn't used to cutting onion very fine. So I'm a person that never liked seasoning from when I was growing up a child. So I would pick out every season you see that my mom would have in the plate or I cook. I would pick them out and throw them away because I don't like to be chewing on it. However, I learned from a chef who cook at our, our seniors on Friday um, how to chop it very fine. So when you chop it very fine, what happened? It lost in the plate. I don't see. I'm just eating on onions, but I'm not seeing the onion to pick it up. So I love that. This, this fall apart at me because it's so small, but I always just cut it very small and um, and ready to go. That one falls apart to me. However, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I cook with onions now, all the seasoning, and I find that I enjoy it more than when the normal way, how we used to put it, slice it and it's big. So I would see everything. And then my next 
last one is thyme. This is coming straight from our garden. So all these things that are here. The onion I purchased, and I'm trying to use the red onion now because I find out that some of these things are more. I'm about keeping healthy. So I, I try to uh, use a lot of things that are more healthy. And I must give a shout out to the farm because 14, 2014, I worked there. And ever since I worked at the farm 2014 as an event coordinator, I, Leticia, they gave me a plot. And from that, 2014, That's I have been planting. I have been planting since 2014. So I, I like my fresh, my fresh stuff. So I, but these are tomatoes, as I said, from last year, but they're frozen. So let me run. So what was the last herb? There was a question. Was it um, thyme? Eh? Thyme. It's thyme. Yeah. So those are the things that I use when I'm cooking. And for everyone to know, you would think that uh, Celia is such a super duper like knowledgeable in gardening. She is still considers herself as a new, uh, not like a professional professional. <laughs> yeah, so she's learning. She's a very humble in that sense. So yeah, um, so if you can do that, you can do it yourselves as well and preserve as much of the garden uh, vegetables and herbs that you have growing. Uh, and you can enjoy it um, uh, during off season. So we're going to start with seeds now. What I'm going to do first, what was the first uh, one that we were cutting? Is that kale? Put, um, I like to cook with olive oil. I know it's not really healthy when you, uh, when you, you hot it, but that's what I like to cook with olive oil. I'm going to do a little bit of um, yeah, because yeah. yeah. I want to put various things in there, and so it's good to go. So, the first thing I'm going to start with is just a um, my garlic, trying to bring that. This is piece that I'm trying to bring into into my recipe. Let it saute a little bit here. So did you come up with just uh, this recipe on your own, um, I Celia? just came up with it on my own. Mm -hmm. Didn't see a recipe, I just thought of I'm not a multi. I'm nowhere close to multi, but multi is a, a little sit home and come up with recipe person. So she has a lot of recipes. So I'm not like multi. I'm just trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, this was one of my little uh, rest way I bought swim and I'm thinking, how can I cook this thing? Right. So because I love a lot of, um, I if you check my recipes, there are a lot of greens all the time, most mm -hmm. of the time, mm -hmm. unless I'm cooking certain meat. So then you can switch up uh, the greens uh, that you use then? Pardon? Depending on what is available? Oh yeah, you, whatever you, is available, you can do it. It doesn't mean, because now it's, and I use it when, when I use the dry one. So I'm going to put the onion and the garlic in here yeah so these these are just um everything in my garden i try to use learn about the stuff the things and that's what i learned at the farm so lots of these things i learned at the farm all about the greens all about freezing in this in the summer i learned all about from the farmers at the at the uh, black creek community farm and so as they as they tell me how to use up all the things that are being grown up there. I just adapt to a lot of it and, and start using them. And I find that the, the flavor of my food come out much better. And um, I'm putting all this um, 
I'm going to put all of them in it. <laughs> so what is that? What is this uh, one? This is chives and basil. And, and I love fresh basil. Fresh basil gives your, your food all this uh, that flavor to it. And it just smells so nice and tastes so nice. So that's why I like the fresh basil. And what is and this, this next is one? This scallion. Scallion. So this is the scallion. And this is, the, I, I know Canada, Canadians mostly use green onion. It's similar, but it's very strong, it's strong comparing to this, yeah, to the smell of it. And the taste of it is much stronger than, um, so I'm going to put tomatoes in it. These I chopped from um, last year. And it's, these pepper came, all of them came from my garden last year. So our, our, our tomatoes are just coming out now. They're not ready to, um, they're not ready for part of it yet. So I have to go back to what I have in the freezer. So that's where the frozen, I know it mentioned in the recipe about a lot of frozen things. I go to my freezer. So I am, I go to my freezer. It's not going to my cupboard most time. It's to my freezer because most of what I have frozen is um, I'm going to put a little bit more oil into this. I, I got them from my um, go to my freezer when I'm cooking. So that's that. And also, give it a little bit to get a little flavor here. And then I'm going to put in. These are some black purple tomatoes I, I had. I coming from my garden. They're purple. You see we have a variety of tomatoes. I had to cover, be put in some um, thing around my tomatoes because I find it's very long we have. Um, this thing that is eating down everything in my garden, so we have to cover them. Now we could get some tomatoes. Yeah. So they said it's simmer a little bit. I use seasoning salt. I don't use a lot of salt. I use a lot of seasoning salt. So because of that. Mildred? Yes. Um, do, is your fingers covering the, the microphone maybe? Um it's kind of it became difficult to hear. So yeah, so I use a lot of um, seasoning salt. It has turmeric in it, this one, Irish seasoning salt. It has turmeric and a lot of spice in it that I like to cook with. So I, I choose that um, to use when I'm cooking. So give me a little bit of salt, salt a little bit. Julia, is this better now? No. Is the audio good? Oh, for no. Celia, for Celia, not for Mildred. Uh huh. This is what it is. Yeah, so. I know. Is it lost? It? No. Lost it in the phone. So I think the sound may have cut out. Um, Mildred is just at the computer um, fixing that a bit. So now we're still watching Celia stirring, um, stirring the what she's making there. Um, but hopefully they'll be back on in a minute. Oh, no. Hmm. We have such a beautiful connection. <laughs> mm. They started with some some Wi-Fi issues 
Uh -oh. oh, there we go. Are we good now? Yeah, we can hear again now. Well, yeah, I think it's, it was my battery. It was dying. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we have a fact. And the, uh, the greens, I'm going to be adding the greens now to the end. I said I was going to put four cups each. And I'm just going to measure with this already. You know, when you're cooking at home, you don't measure, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> when you're cooking at home, you do not measure, right? My fish, you don't measure. So, this is a color. And color is something that you have to cut it very fine. So if you don't call it very fine, people who know how to cut it will criticize you. <laughs> mm. Like it's normally do. They know when it's my mom that cook it, cut it up and cook it, that's when it's me. Because I don't spend all the time to sit there and cut it to spies, not at her. And so they criticize me. Celia, quick question. Did you already add the shrimp in there? Oh yeah, I put that a long time before she before she um chopped up. Okay. Before her phone, before her phone stopped working, okay. I had it and it was sauteed with the vegetables and the herbs. So I'm mixing everything together that they cook nicely together. So then I have the kale that looks more like, a, uh, this looks more like four cups. So. Cornelia, you're asking if Kalu is amaranth. I, are they closely related? Um, I would say there are some amaranth that is strictly more, more of like the decorative for their nice uh, foliage. Um, but the Kalu that they use here mostly, it's a variety that the, the one that's like most people like use for cooking, which is like the green one. There's also a variety that is like red, right? Uh, like a uh, again. And I like to use cayenne pepper because I heard that black pepper is not good for our gender. I don't know how true that is. But <laughs> I start using cayenne that this is much healthier. So as I said, um healthy um cooker or even at my house, you come in and try to shop. When I'm shopping, you say, oh, you just buy all these things. But I shop healthy, and I cook healthy. So wow. I'm going to do something that I like to use called in pimento. It grows into our country. I don't know which other country it grows in, but I think so because I see it in the store selling. Um, so I'm going to put a few little seeds. I can't use so much of it. Can, it Can you show it? Uh, so this is... Pimento. It looks like big pepper. They look like black pepper. Okay. And one thing I like to do with it also, I like to crush it and put it in. I find it gives you a total different flavor when you crush it. So I like to crush a little bit of it also and put it in the pot. Uh, as I said, I'm for flavor. Uh, see the innovative way that she's crushing the pimento. There's no mortar and pestle, and this is what you do. A ball, roll it over the pimento. 
and he gives you all the flavor that you need. And then you just sprinkle it over it. Celia, there was one question that what was put into the pan first? Um, all the, um, the garlic, the ginger. Okay. The very first one was the, the garlic. Ginger. The very first one was garlic, right? No, ginger. Oh, was it ginger? Oh. Yeah, I saw it in the ginger. So I'm putting thyme. It gives you a nice flavor, especially the green thyme. But if you dry them, I know people like to dehydrate, but I don't because I, I think it, I lose my, my aroma from, from dehydrating. So I don't like to dehydrate. Just like to dry my season and, and put everything in. Well, you should smell it, everyone. It smells so good in here. And I put a little bit, a little bit more flavor. I'm going off the flavor. Um, Cornelia is hungry. So, so this is the dry seasoning from all the herbs. I did. Uh oh. It looks like the phone froze for a second. Um. Hopefully they'll come back in one minute. And what you can do with the dry season uh, that I do, when I buy my meat or fish, whatever it is, I cut and season it up with the green herb and put it in freezer bags and put it down. So when I'm ready to cook, it's marinated, it's, it has great flavor when it's cooked and it's ready to go. So let me see my face. Just a little bit more because I didn't use any sauce, so just gonna stick to this as I normally do. Wow, so this is all about like building up the flavors. This yeah. is the <laughs> secret of a lot of chefs is building up the flavors. Flavor. Mm -hmm. It's all about flavor. Um I don't have boiling water here, but uh, I think you just need just a little bit more. I like, I like gravy. I don't like dry stuff. So because I like gravy, not oil, so I like to put a little bit of water, let it simmer down. As I said, I like to use boiling water, but I don't have that here. Uh-oh. I'm just putting up the recipe on the screen since they've cut out. Shrimp, oh. greens, uh, cottle, switch chard, and kale, and all the herbs, and tomatoes, and onions, and kellens, and all of it. So this is my product. So it's going to simmer for another 10 minutes, and it's good to go. All right. That's wonderful. Amazing work, um, Celia. So it's. I need to put it out there and I need to. I need to put it out Margarine. Give it a little bit. Yeah. Can you use butter instead? Oh, uh, yeah. You can use anything. Okay. It's just about, it's about three. Okay. All right. All right. So this is a type of stir fry that you need to cook it down a little bit. It's yeah. not strictly stir fry. It's strictly stir fry. Yeah. I never I, I've never gotten into stir fry. So <laughs> it's something that I need to uh, look at. Yeah. And to address more. But um I think um I need to um do a little bit more. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Celia. Amazing work. Okay. So is there any questions, clarifications um, about Celia's presentation?
I have a question about the uh, Callaloo. Uh, before you freeze it, like, do you use, do you take out just the leaves or you use no. the whole plant? You use the, the entire, uh, you cut it, uh, color it something that keep growing. So you cut it at a certain level and leave it that it can continue to, to be there to grow more, Callaloo. So you would cook it home, um, as far as you carry a stock, um, and you strip it. So from where you cut it from the from the plant, you would strip the callaloo and it will have some strip that comes off. So it's a little different from kale and sweet chard. You have to strip it off. And then you but cut then it back. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you blanch the greens before you freeze it or you freeze it fresh? I freeze it fresh. So what I do when I have this, I take it home and I run the cold water and need to wash them properly. And then I chop them fine the way I want to cook it. And then I put it in freezer bags and put it in my freezer. Hmm. But if somebody have a, uh, another way um, to blanch it, I've never done that. I don't know about it. Um, I still, we'll learn from that and see if that works. Okay. So far, that's how I've been doing it. Um, yeah. So multi, uh, if I recall, multi, you blanch your greens. Is that right? Multi, are you here? Because on the internet, she was on mute. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, what did you ask me? So, uh, so Celia doesn't blanch her greens before freezing them. So that's one way that, that you can do uh, the vegetables. But, but you, I recall you mentioning that you blanch yours, correct? Some of them I blanch, some I don't blanch. You know, like if I want to do green beans, so I blanch it. But um, with the, the kale and the whatnot, I just wash it and let the water dry out properly and I chop it and put it in the freezer bag and put it in the freezer. Correct. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's two ways. I know some people, they don't have time to like blanch. Like me, sometimes like uh, I don't really have time to blanch. So I just freeze them as well uh, because they come um, in like a tons of like leaves in the season. So I don't always have time. So if you look at the tip of the week today that was posted by Christina uh, on our social media, uh, it explains there what it means like pre-freezing. That means you don't have to blanch the vegetable. So what you do is you just uh, rinse the vegetables, chop them up, lay them down in a uh, cooking cookie sheet and freeze them for a couple of hours in the freezer so it they crisp up and then you put them in um, a ziploc and you you um and, and then you put it away in the freezer for long um, term use and they can last for nine months Mildred, it, the sound is quite choppy <laughs> um can i answer that <laughs> Yes. Okay, I can answer that one for you. Or if, if you want to blanch it, you just put the water to boil. And when the water boils, just dunk whatever you want in it and just keep it for about two minutes. And as soon as you take it out, you give it an ice bath. So uh, why do you do that? You boil with lots of water and you put it in there. And then when you take it out, leave it there and you take it out and put it in the colander, it comes out still crispy. It's not soggy or anything like that. So that's how you blanch. Oh, uh, why? Why do you have? What do you do that? Why do you do that? Like, what's the benefit? It's fresh. It's nice. Okay, let's say you you blanch in beans. Now, if you put beans just like that in the freezer, it accumulates the ice, and when you thaw it out, it becomes soggy. If you blanch it and you put it in, you thaw it out, it's crispy. So you still get the crisp in the beans. Oh. Yeah, so with, with blanching, it doesn't actually cook it. What it does is that it like activates certain enzymes that would otherwise be activated through freezing. So you're actually just going a step ahead and preserving the color and the nutrients yeah. by blanching it. Oh, yeah.
That's good to know. Thank you. It seems like Daniel is here now. Um, Daniel, can you, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's ah, good. finally. Great. So yeah. I'm going to suggest we should move uh, to to Daniel's part of the um, into the next part of the session, and then maybe do some more questions at the end. Okay. Okay. I'm ready to go. Okay. So I'm sharing the presentation, and Mildred will just um, introduce you. Um, I think Mildred's sound is not working very well, so I will introduce you. Unless Christina, Christina, do you want to introduce Daniel? Yeah, I don't mind. Um, okay. Daniel, let me know if I'm missing anything, but Daniel is a highly skilled pastry chef and cook. Um, his culinary career has taken him all over the world, including Papua New Guinea, France, and the British Isles. Um, he's talked a lot and like has really great knowledge on the benefits of baking with non-commodified wheats and non-industrial flours, both for the quality of taste in like the breads and the pastries that you bake, but also like for the environment as well. Um, in the past, Daniel has been involved in a lot of political work. Um, he was in, involved with the International Socialists that worked for many social causes, including union rights, and he does work with the NDP. He's very passionate about healthy cooking and eating and how that plays an overall impact on the quality of life. And yeah, Daniel, let me know if I missed anything. Well, you elaborated a few things there. I, I haven't been to Indonesia, but I worked in Indonesian cooking. I've done that kind of thing. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've cooked uh, Indonesian food. I've done line cooking. I've done baking. I've done all sorts of things. I went to cooking school and all that kind of stuff. Amazing. Okay, so I guess you want to start with the uh, the muffins? Yes. Okay, oh, so yes. I only oh, know... I already made a set of muffins, uh, rather large ones. These are pumpkin, uh, uh, these are uh, zucchini muffins with uh, uh, walnuts and a little bit of cinnamon on top. They're quite large, take a little while to bake. And then uh, I have, and they're made with eggs, so I, I'm sure people aren't too keen on eggs uh, if they're uh, following a vegan diet. But this uh, recipe that I have here, uh, with the chocolate muffins, it's going to be made uh, without eggs. And so um, I have all my Missy plats, so I have everything all set up, scaled. Um, ideally, you want to scale uh, 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 your ingredients because if you're measuring, if you're using a measuring cup and dipping that measuring cup into the, uh, a bag of flour and pulling that measuring cup out, you're actually getting more than a, a cup of uh, flour. You're getting like a cup and a, a quarter, a cup and a fifth. And that's not a big deal, but the problem is when you have too much flour in re relation to the other ingredients, like sugar, like eggs, uh, liquids, it, it becomes drier, it doesn't rise as much, has many uh, negative effects. So what you do with the measure flour is you take a smaller measuring cup, dip it into the flour, and then put that into the measuring cup and then level it off. That way you don't have too much flour. I scaled everything, so I use this uh, uh, an exact weight. So um, what we have here is um, I also have olive oil. And since, since I'm using olive oil as a fat, um, and it's real olive oil, it's, uh, it's, it, it's uh, actually uh, olive oil from uh, California. Um, and the big issue with olive oil is most olive oil that you buy in a store, a supermarket like La Blas or IGA or whatever, nine times out of ten, the olive oil is not olive oil. It's actually, if it is any olive oil, it's old rancid olive oil. Um, olive oil is not smooth. Olive oil is very bitter. And so, you know, you, what they're uh, cutting it with, they're cutting with canola oil. And actually, you're not getting the health benefits of eating olive oil. You're getting the negative effects of eating canola oil. And I have real olive oil here. 
So, okay, so we got to cream the the, uh, the fat and sugar. So I got my, uh, I have my, 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 well, it's a little too big. But anyway, I have my uh, mixer here. I'm going to add my sugar, which is 300 grams or a cup and a half. Now I'm going to add all my oil, and I'm going to use my offset, use my uh, spatula to get all the oil out. And now I'm going to start creaming that. Now the ideal of creaming is to uh, to get the sugar soft and get it wet, sort of uh, like. And the idea is because uh, salt and sugar actually chemically have the same response. They absorb liquid. So as soon as you add the, as soon as you add the liquid, you want to start turning on the mixer and get it rolling because otherwise you'll get little spots with eggs or with oil or butter or whatever. You get little spots uh, that are like burnt. So now I have my vanilla. I don't have much vanilla left, but I'm going to use all this vanilla, which I'm going to add. Uh, my recipe calls for uh, a tablespoon. That's about a tablespoon. So I'll add all that in. Daniel, um, yeah. can you move the phone back a little bit? Um, we can't quite see what you're, what you're doing right now. Okay. Move it or point it at... Um, Is that better, this? Well, yeah. Now we can see the we can see the bowl now. Um, but if it's possible to push it back a little bit, we'll be able to see a bit better. Is that better, like this? Yeah. Now we can see. Now we can see it. <laughs> okay. So I added the vanilla. I'm just gonna mix that around a little bit. And so now I'm gonna scrape the bowl. Now the reason why I scrape the bowl is because the bottom is going to have little bits of sugar that aren't uh, mixed with the olive oil, right? And I'm using this uh, 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 spatula to do so. So the next ingredient I'm going to add is the, uh, is the flour and the cocoa powder, the dry ingredient. So when you add flour, and anytime there's a liquid involved, whether it be eggs, olive oil, milk, whatever, you have to be careful adding to, uh, the flour and mixing it too long because you'll develop the gluten. Now, gluten is not a bad thing if you're making bread, but gluten also uh, makes it tough or tougher. So ideally, what you want to do is just add it and mix it together, which I'm going to do right now. So here's, I, and here I have a mixture of um, whole wheat flour, half whole wheat flour and half white flour. And the white flour is, uh, is, um, is has more starch in white flour. So you'll get more activity when it rises because there's a chemical reaction with the chemical level, there, which I have also have measured out. So I'm going to dump these in. I'm going to dump in my cocoa powder. Now with cocoa powder, ideally what you want to do is uh, put it through, uh, uh, put it through, uh, put it through a, a sifter because you get little chunks. But I'm using a good cocoa powder. Uh, it's about 22-24% cacao uh, solids, so I'm just going to dump that in. And then here I have my chemical lavenders. So what they are is I have uh, baking soda, uh, baking powder, and a bit of salt. I'm going to add this. And so now, I'm just going to mix that around a little bit. Once again, what I'll do is I'm going to scrape up the bottom because this, I'm going to add my zucchini next. Now I have I have about three cups of zucchini, grated zucchini, with the skin on. I wash them and then I uh, dry them off and then uh, grated them up. So that's part of our liquid. Now a lot of times recipes will call for uh, zucchini that you you uh, you put on a, a tea towel and then squeeze out the water. 
I don't do that because this is a bit dry. So adding my uh, zucchini is, is also part of the moisture. And you can see here I have it all graded up. So now I'm just going to add it in. Take my spatula and get all the, the little bits in. So again, so I already added the flour, so I don't want to mix it too long. I got all the liquid in there. I got the liquid from the zucchini. So now I'm going to just mix it up again. Not too long. And that's perfect. So now, you rinse off my hand a little bit. So I'm going to scrape down the sides here. Get all my all my ingredients together. And so now I have to I have to no. The key here is when you're adding to your uh, your 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 muffin tin is you don't want to overfill it. So ideally. Regardless of the size, you can see these are monstrosities of uh, muffins, and these are, are, are a bit smaller. All you want to do is fill it up no more than two-thirds. Oh, I forgot, merciful Jesus, I forgot my chocolate chips. No big deal. Going to give that a quick mix. There we go. See now you see how wet that is, and because of those those lovely zucchinis, and there were quite large zucchinis that I was given. So now, I'm going to use this scoop, and I'm going to put three of these scoops in each muffin, each muffin tin, I should say. And I use this way here because it's easy to get out. So, one, actually not, I'm going to do two, excuse me. And if you wanted to, with anything, uh, uh, you can use bananas, uh, you can use pumpkin, uh, canned pumpkin, for example. You can use any any type of vegetable you want, um, but you want to make sure it's sweet. And um, also, you got to watch the liquid content because if you don't have enough liquid, it's not going to do, uh, um, mix well, and it'll be too dry when it bakes. Because all, all we're going to bake these for maybe 15, 20 minutes in a 350 oven. Now, the other muffins that I made, um, they're quite large, and they take... Uh, they take double, almost double time. They take about 30 minutes of baking. But the method's the same. All you want to do is uh, divide your dough evenly, right? And then what you want to do is make sure that if you're going to add any topping, you should add the topping at the end, of course. But I'm not going to add any topping to this because there's enough. I think there's enough going on here with the chocolate, the cocoa powder, and the uh, and chemical lavenders. So it, it, and there's salt in the in, in the chemical lavenders. So you're going to get that. Um, I wouldn't say eating yang, but salt draws out flavor uh, from the zucchini, from the uh, cacao powder, and also from the uh, chocolate. Um, anytime that you uh, do anything with chocolate, one should always add a bit of salt. Uh, I make, for example, I make a hot chocolate for my partner almost weekly. And anytime I make hot chocolate, whether I'm using caramel or I'm using uh, sugar or whatever I'm using, I'm always adding at least a teaspoon, if not more, depending on how much chocolate, to the uh, uh, recipe. Because the, the, um, the salt and the, the salt response to the chocolate and it brings out the flavors. So here I have 
I have a, a dozen tins. And I have a bit more here. Shorts. They're all about even. And there we have it. So now this is going to go in the oven for about 15, maybe 20 minutes. And um, they'll be done. Let me get my cloth to put it in my hand. So you've got to have a preheated oven 350. And then you want to make sure it's on the bottom rack all the way to the back. Because if you don't have it on the bottom rack all the way to the back, um, you don't get the oven springs, and then you don't get the reaction from the uh, chemical lavenders. So my time, get my phone on, I have uh, 308. So I'm going to check it uh, about three about 312, and then I'll check it again at about 315 uh, at the latest, and I should have muffins. Hope that made some sense, and um, forgive me for uh, messing up today, but we got it together, I guess. We did. Technology right now is, is a difficult thing for a lot of people, but I think we... Um... We got it together and we made this happen. So that's great. Does anyone, um, does anyone have any questions for Daniel about the recipe? Um, so for um, my question is just like zucchini, I've heard a lot about zucchini cake and zucchini muffins, but not a lot about pumpkin cake or pumpkin. Can we use the same exact same proportion of pumpkin? Yes, you can, um, but you have to be careful when you're adding the pumpkin. Um, and the reason why is that um, the moisture content of pumpkin is less than the zucchini, so you might get a little. It, it might be a little drier, uh, and it may cook a little quicker. If that makes any sense, if you're so using that, a pumpkin. Does that also mean I can put a little bit more pumpkin? Um, no, uh, you, you got to watch the ratios because if you add too much of uh, one thing, it might affect the chemical lavenders, it might affect the flour, it can affect uh, uh, the sugar content. So if you're adding like a pumpkin, pumpkin's sweeter than zucchini. So if you, if you add too much pumpkin, you're adding more sweetness to the uh, muffin or the loaf, whatever it is you're making. And the texture also might not be right, yeah. Well, the texture, uh, um, that's what you bake it, right? So you're going to touch it, you're going to feel it, right? You're going to look at it, you're going to touch the top, see how it feels. Like, when I bake these, when I bake these, I, I touch the top. And yeah. so the middle, I, and I always, since there's a dozen uh, muffins, I always go in the middle. And you go in the middle because the outside is going to bake first. The middle is not going to bake first, but the middle is done. The outside is done for sure. So you want that sweet spot where the uh, outside is done and the middle is done. And quite often, you got to check your uh, uh, your muffins uh, two or three times. It's not like a, a written in stone that's done at a certain time. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was about to. I was about to ask the same question. I was thinking about pumpkin, that um, maybe when I go to Jamaica, I might make something with pumpkin. So I was just thinking, and you asked, well, Madula, you asked the question that I was about to ask about the pumpkin. Yeah, no, pumpkin, uh, pumpkin's quite versatile. And then the pumpkins here we have in Ontario, or Canada, I should say, I don't believe that the canned pumpkin is actually uh, uh, a pumpkin that you get like it, uh, grown at the Black Creek Community Farm, but um, it's already prepared, it's already cooked, it's already cleaned. Uh, this, sadly, this, the pumpkin seeds are missing, but yeah, you can uh, you, you can still uh, uh, use that uh, the same way. Anyone have any last burning questions? We're about 15 minutes over time and I don't want to keep everyone. Um, but any last burning questions for Daniel? Okay. So what flour do you normally use, Daniel? Is it white or is it uh, wheat? I use, well, I use a different flour. I use, um, 
I use uh, well, I use a flower from a company in in Beaton, Ontario called uh, um, what's it called K two K two milling, and he mills his uh, flowers fundamentally different than these uh, large uh, bog in Hamilton down near the lake in his bay. They have a brand new mill. It's got to be six or eight stories in heights. It's massive. And what they do is they run flour through uh, a grain of, the grain of wheat through the mills five, six, seven times to separate the germ and the bran. And then at the end, they put it all back together, calling it whole wheat. Where I get my flour from, he mills it once at a lower temperature, and you get like a different uh, looking flour. You get a different uh, fl a flavor of flour, much more flavor of flour, and you get a different feel. Uh, again, it's called uh, K2 milling. So not all flowers are created equal. No, no. Uh, different mills, uh, different, uh, different flowers are grown different times of year, so some have more uh, gluten, some have less gluten. Uh, there's pastry flour, there's uh, red flour, there's all-purpose flour. Um, for, for muffins, you can use red flour. I'm using whole wheat bread flour, but you can, I'm mostly using a, a K2's version of all-purpose flour. And the difference between all-purpose flour and, and whole wheat flour is the, there's more bran and germ, uh, which makes less gluten, um, but it, it also creates much more flavor and there's much more nutrients for the body. So there's bran and the bran has a lot of uh, uh, B vitamins. And then there's the germ that has even more B vitamins. But the downside to uh, germ and the reason why they don't put that much germ in whole wheat is that uh, the germ can uh, go rancid quicker and ruining your flour. So what's the best way to keep the flowers um, uh, stored, uh, Daniel? Is it freezer? How's no, I, I I leave it. It's I have it on these my I mean it's here in my in my, uh, in my cupboard, and um, you just you just uh, you don't don't keep it cold because you if you make bread with it you want a certain temperature, if you're gonna make uh, uh, muffins you want again a certain temperature, so I keep it at room temperature. Uh, I just don't purchase so much that. Uh, 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 that it stays there forever. Um, you got to watch uh, for weevils. You got to watch for different germs or different bugs that are in there. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, flour, long as it's uh, room temperature, flour can last uh, for years. Well, I wouldn't say years, but for a year or two. Thank you. Amazing. So one thing more for my recipe is that you can uh, you oh, can use oh Celia is gonna show the final uh, product. I am so hungry right now because <laughs> I didn't eat proper breakfast and lunch. <laughs> oh, you just have to tell it. Yeah. So here it is. Um. Lunch we have to have a taste of. Uh, smells so good. You gotta try it. it. It it smells earthy flavors because of the kalalu. And so yeah. And you can um, I use different rice, um, whatever I choose to use it with. Maybe some um, macaroni, whatever you choose to eat it with. You can. You can eat it with bread. You can eat it anything you want. Amazing. All right. So yes, thank you so much, uh, Celia and Daniel. If there's um, no more questions, or if you come up with a question, you can always like uh, shoot us an email or um, uh, s send us any comments on the on the YouTube. So this will be made available on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, so watch out for that, and all the recipes will also be posted um, online on our website. So keep an eye out for that. And um, so, yeah, so watch out for the next uh, workshop, which is coming to you in, uh, in two weeks' time. So we have another, like, a set of uh, community leaders. We have um, another one with a chef background. And so it's so exciting.